Hi everyone, I'm here with Sophia. Sophia lived in Pakistan and I was like, what? So most people who are foreigners are kind of scared of Pakistan and here is a person who is saying I am in love with this country. So I want to learn more about this love. Um, so tell us more, what were you doing in Pakistan? Well, I first went to Pakistan um, when I was 24 years old. I was working in the city in London and I went on a, a trekking holiday to Chitral and I spent my 25th birthday watching a wild polo match as the sun came down and a shard of light came through the mountains like a spotlight following the, the polo players. And I had an extraordinarily sort of transcendental experience in that moment and I knew that I was going to live in that place and that I'd found my spiritual home. So you spent a year there living there? So then I came back to London and I, I waited until I picked up my Christmas bonus and then I went into my chairman's office, handed in my resignation and went and spent it on school books and equipment and went back out to, to Chitral where I'd been asked by the local deputy commissioner, Major Javed Majid, if I could help him set up a school that he was planning um, because he, he was a very uh, inspired uh, deputy commissioner at the time he wanted to bring education quality education in, in English medium to to Chitral and he succeeded and the school exists to this day it's very famous in Pakistan it's it was um, it was called Sayuj public school when we started it it's now been renamed uh, Langlands College or it was renamed Langlands College after the legendary uh, um, headmaster major Langlands Jeffrey Langlands who's also very well known in Pakistan he sadly died last year so when was the last time you were there? I was there, must be about uh, 2016, I think. Okay. 2016, 2017, I went back. I love going back. It's, it's, a, it's a homecoming for me. How and can we bring you and other people back more often? What do we need to do? Security is the major issue. I mean, Still I, is, you think? Yes. I, I lived in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, I have a very high tolerance for risk. Um, most people don't um, and when they can choose anywhere in the world to travel to where, which is equally beautiful and equally diverse and fascinating they don't want to put their their set themselves at risk of, of uh, any kind of harm um, so I think security is the number one concern um, for everybody um, and I, I personally believe that Pakistan is very safe I mean I'm happy to go myself um, but I, I don't necessarily want to encourage, say, young people to spend their year off there because I wouldn't want to be responsible for something happening. And things do happen. They happen in Afghanistan, and to a lesser extent, they happen in Pakistan. I remember um, I promised my family I wouldn't go back to Afghanistan at a certain point, um, and I accepted a wedding invitation in Lahore uh, a couple of years ago, and I, I attended uh, thinking, well, nothing's going to happen, everything's fine. And the day that I attended the wedding in Lahore, there was a massive suicide bombing in, in the gardens in Lahore. Um, and then I, I, and so I thought, well, this is, uh, you know, obviously tragic and, and very unfortunate. So I thought I'd better go to Islamabad because, um, you know, it'll be safer in Islamabad. And as I arrived in Islamabad, there was a massive violent demonstration of people walking on parliament. And then there was sort of martial law in Islamabad and I wasn't able to move around for a few days. So um, that's not normal by most country standards. And uh, I would say that, um, you know, sort out your security. That was which year? I, I actually, I don't recall. It was probably 2016, um, 2015, 2016. Um, probably 2016, I, uh, spring. I don't recall exactly when it was. Now, what do you do nowadays? So I have a non-profit called Future Brilliance and through Future Brilliance we, I had an initial non-profit called Learning for Life which we set up in 1990 and uh, we were able to partner with the Sarhad Rural Support Program and the National Rural Support Program, NRSP and SRSP to uh, fund a number of uh, school startups in a little mini private school startups in the rural areas um, and I think we, we helped set up quite a few actually, maybe even 250 of these small little village schools. And then um, I spent some time in Afghanistan and we were funded to establish Future Brilliance, which is to help school leavers get jobs. And we've been helping artisans, jewelry, jewelry manufacturers and jam cutters with equipment, with training and helping them build access to markets. So that's my nonprofit side. And my own side, um, 
I, um, I'm, I've got a new startup uh, which is focused on, on Europe and, and uh, eventually North America and uh, we're aiming now to establish a gender lens SDG fund so that's a, a, a venture capital fund which is going to be investing in successful female founders who have technology solutions to address the, the global challenges so uh, we will be funding for instance companies uh, that are uh, that have solutions for measuring car carbon emissions both on a corporate and on, on a personal level and also uh, uh, enabling the individual and corporations to offset their carbon emissions so rather than people feeling overwhelmed and unable to in some way do something about the problems that we globally as a, as a species are facing we're going to uh, empower people and corporations to do something about it by backing female uh, solutions. These are outstanding women entrepreneurs who've come up with algorithms and AI solutions that are going to put the uh, to empower individuals to actually have some agency for take all the take responsibility for all the SDGs or particular SDGs. Well, um, the uh, I think it's going to be all the SDGs. So any women uh, backed, any women founded company or women led company that has a technology for good solution that can be measured in some way by uh, two or more of the 17 United Nations Sustain Sustainable Development Goals. So because it's female founded or female led, SDG five, which is then gender equality, will already be there, but there'll need to be another one. So life on land, life uh, uh, underwater, um, helping to eradicate uh, the causes of extreme poverty um, and also partnerships. I'm a huge believer in collaboration from the very beginning. For instance, with Learning for Life, our first NGO, we were in partnership with a Pakistani NGO that was very responsible and very uh, well led, and it still is, based in Peshawar actually. Um, and uh, so I'm a huge believer in collaboration and um, holding hands across across the oceans. Um, and I think that, that in, you, you asked about security. Uh, I believe that, that as a species, our greatest threat, um, you know, is, is, is our very survival. So all the little arguments we have with our neighbors, with our neighboring countries, these things are dwarfed in comparison with, uh, with the threat to the species. And once we recognize that, I'm hoping that we can come together as, as a species, as humans, to collaborate to address the real issues, which are pollution and, uh, you know, war creates pollution. Experimenting with nuclear warheads creates pollution. Exploding things in space creates space pollution which is going to threaten the future of our uh, species as well so let's come together and and work for the survival of the very planet so which where in the world do you call home right now beside <laughs> the whole planet uh, uh, I'm, I'm London based um, I think I like to think of myself as a global citizen, so I feel enormous affinity and, and, and love for many nations and many peoples, and, and I, I've traveled so much and lived so globally. I feel affinities with more than one culture and more than one country. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.